reported a fire in the building. One person stuck inside. The male is barricaded. He's not answering the door. Everyone else is outside the house. They're trying to get him to open up. And that was the untimely death of former Zappos CEO Tony Shea in a house fire when he was just 46 years old. In 2009, the Harvard grad sold the online shoe retailer to Amazon for $1.2 billion, but remained on a CEO until this past August. What do you what do you do all day? Are yeah, you completely so, useless now? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the only way I get interviewed at conferences like this. <laughs> and so what you're referring to as a CEO role, uh, my authority is actually very limited. And that being said, I actually fill a number of roles. It's probably 10 different roles within the entire organization. So what do you do all day? I'm still, at, I mean, what, what do you do? Not, you don't get to fire people. You don't get to tell people what to do. Um, what do you do? For me, it's really just about filling whatever need the company has. And it's not just me, though, but every employee can constantly do what it takes to be themselves. What would you themselves. want to do? Well, what would you want if you weren't doing this? Like, I, I guess you what I'm saying be is... The, be at Zappos. What would you do? Right, so it doesn't matter what environment. I, I guess what I'm trying to say, maybe poorly, is that I want to help create... Uh, Now, it's not at all clear that Tony Shea wanted to die. His death was, in fact, ruled unintentional. Nor is it clear, though, that he was entirely committed to living. Like so many Americans struggling with mental health issues and addiction, quarantine hit Tony really hard. The Wall Street Journal reported that he had become obsessed with depriving his body of all of the essential elements of life, everything from food to sleep, even to oxygen. Indeed, the night of his death, he had brought a heater into a shed in order to reduce the level of oxygen that was in the air. When the fire started, emergency workers couldn't get into that shed in order to save him. Now, what does it say about a society that someone who has achieved everything we're told to achieve in order to have that happiness, have that fulfillment, is so deeply miserable that they spend their days just trying to numb themselves? A celebrated young billionaire obsessed with happiness and finding none of it in the places that we are all told to look. Like, there have to be reasons that you get up in the morning and you want to live. Like, why do you want to live? What, what's the point? What, what inspires you? What, what do you love about the future? And if, if we're not out there, if the future does not include being out there among the stars, it's incredibly depressing if that's not the future that we're going to have. I'm not trying to be anyone's savior. Uh, that is not the... I, I'm just trying to... Think about the future and not be sad. When I was 17, I read a quote that went something like, if you live each day as if it was your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. It made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. One year and 13 days ago, I lost my husband, Dave. His death was sudden and unexpected. We were in Mexico celebrating a friend's 50th birthday party. I took a nap. He went to work out. What followed was the unthinkable. I walked into a gym to find him lying on the floor. I flew home to tell my children that their father was gone. I watched his casket being lowered into the ground. For many months afterwards, and at many times since, I was swallowed in the deep fog of grief, what I think of as the void, an emptiness that fills your heart and your lungs, constricts your ability to think or even to breathe. Dave's death changed me in very profound ways. 
I learned about the depths of sadness and the brutality of loss. But I also learned that when life sucks you under, you can kick against the bottom, find the surface, and breathe again. I learned that in the face of the void, or in the face of any challenge, you can choose joy and meaning. Many of you have already experienced the kind of tragedy and hardship that leaves an indelible mark. What I want to talk about today is what you do next, about the things you can do to overcome adversity, no matter when it hits you or how it hits. The easy days ahead of you will be easy. It is the hard days, the days that challenge you to your very core that will determine who you are. You will be defined not just by what you achieve, but by how you survive. One day, my friend Adam Grant, a psychologist, suggested that I think about how much worse things could be. Worse, I said to him, are you crazy? How could things be worse? He looked at me and said, Dave could have had that same cardiac arrhythmia driving your children. The minute he said it, I felt overwhelming gratitude that my children were alive. And that gratitude overtook some of the grief. Finding gratitude and appreciation is key to resilience. People who take the time to list the things they're grateful for are healthier and happier. Eleven days before the anniversary of Dave's death, I broke down crying to a friend of mine. We were sitting of all places on a bathroom floor. I said 11 days. A year ago, he had 11 days left, and we had no idea. And then through tears, we asked each other how we would live if we knew we had 11 days left. Can you ask yourselves to live as if you had 11 days left? I don't mean blow everything off and party all the time. I mean live with the understanding of how precious every day would be, because that's how precious every day actually is. What are you going to do with what you have? I'm not talking about how much you have. Some of you are business majors, some of you are theologians, nurses, sociologists, some of you have money, some of you have patience, some of you have kindness, some of you have love, some of you have the gift of long suffering, whatever it is, whatever your gift is, what are you going to do with what you have? You will never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. You can't take it with you. You've now, in the, this process, if you didn't already, you've known Ali, mm -hmm. and then you went and met Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela you know. yeah. Do they share anything? Absolutely. The, the complex simplicity of yeah. greatness yeah. and how greatness is not this wonderful, esoteric, elusive, uh, God-like feature that only the special among us are, will ever taste. You know, it's something that truly exists in all of us. Sitting with Ali, sitting with Nelson Mandela, it's very simple. This is what I believe, and I'm willing to die for it. It's that simple. I know who I am and I know what I believe. I know who I am, I know who, what I believe. that's all I need to know. And that's all, all I, I need, need to, to know. know. So from there, you do what you need to do. Yeah. You know? And I think what happens is we make this situation more complex. You know, the normal among among us. Make it more complex sure. than it has to because be. Because we're looking for complexity. There's got to be Absolutely. something complex to understand. It right? can't be that easy. No. Did you think, I need to pack this in? Never. Why not? I don't ever give up. I mean, I'd have to be dead or completely incapacitated. I'm going to dedicate my life to using my name and popularity, helping charities, helping people, uniting people, bring, 
people bumming each other because of religious beliefs. We need somebody in the world to help us make peace. Because we live how long? 80 years? Some of you are going to be dead 20 years from now. Some of you are going to be dead 50 years from now. Some are going to be dead 30. Some are going to be dead 60, 70 years from now. We are going to die soon. This is a test. This is not the life now. Your real self is inside you. Your body gets old. Some of you go to look at the fridge, look old. You don't have no teeth. Your hair is leaving you. Your bodies get tired. But your soul and your spirit never die. That's going to live forever. So your body is just housing your soul and spirit. So this physical stuff don't last for so long. So my car, this building is going to be here when the man who built it dead. There have been many kings and queens of England. They're all dead. After this one is gone, another one will come. So we don't stay here. We're just trustees. We don't own nothing. I used to believe that who I was ended at the edge of my skin, that I had been given this little vehicle called a body from which to experience creation. And though I couldn't have asked for a sportier model, <laughs> it was, after all, a loner and would have to be returned. <laughs> then I learned that everything outside the vehicle was part of me, too. And now I drive a convertible. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet, death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, the new is you. But someday, not too long from now, you will gradually become the old and be cleared away. Sorry to be so dramatic, but it's quite true. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. You don't set out to build a wall. You don't say, I'm going to build the biggest, baddest, greatest wall that's ever been built. You don't start there. You say, I'm going to lay this brick yeah. as perfectly as a brick can be laid. There will not be one brick on the face of the earth that's going to be laid better than this brick that I'm going to lay in this next 10 minutes. Yeah. And you do that every single day. And soon you have a and wall. And soon you have a wall. Every day. It's against this fucking wall. Excuse my language. But it's up against this motherfucker because it's what I believe in. And when my back is against this motherfucker, then there's nowhere to go. But that way, that's it. Because you made it already. We made it. Uh, for me, I need this. I need this. So every day, my back is up against this motherfucker. And this is how I operate. Now, doesn't mean you don't smile. Doesn't mean you don't laugh and joke, quote, right? You're happy, I'm happy, I'm a happy guy. But when it comes to business, and when it comes to executing, up against this and I got to go that way.